in a given environment, arbitrary environment. So if you know an environment, meaning you know the concentration in this group of media and you know exactly how it changes in time, can we even define, or, uh, can we find or ex even exist a optimal strategy in this environment? And the second question is, can microbes actually implement this kind of optimal strategy or at least approximate that? Today, I want to completely focus only on the first question, right? So I'm not talking about the second one. So to start with, um, we have to define some things. We have to define what would be the specific growth rate and just define as the proportional change in the number of cells in a population. So we can define with this, uh, sorry, derivative here. And in the very specific and special conditions of or that we have a constant environment that we can achieve, for example, in a lab experiment, we can achieve a state of balance growth, meaning that uh, all the concentrations and the growth rate itself of this population remains constant in time. So that's a very specific kind of scenario. And the specific growth rate in this particular kind of scenario can be a measure of fitness for this population. But in general, that's not what we have in, in nature, of course, right? So that the problem that we want to achieve, uh, address today is the dynamical growth, I mean, meaning uh, if you have change environments, and so the concentration change in time and the growth, the specific growth rate change in time, um, uh, we can talk about the absolute fitness, meaning that's, I think, a term from population genetics, right? So it's just defined as the final uh, number of cells of a population after a period of time, T, divided by the initial one, so the proportional change in the population. So that uh, we can achieve that just by uh, taking the integral of this first equation, right? That's a simple uh, procedure. So you have this exponential that just to simplify things in the next slide, we are concerned that our measure of fitness is just this, uh, this simple one in the bottom. It's just, ex uh, we don't take the exponential, but in essence, they are, represent the same thing. So we, want, we are talking about dynamical systems um, and optimality, and just to make the point that these two things go hand in hand from the beginning, right? So as you may guess uh, from the title of this talk also, we take a great um, inspiration from classical mechanics, so from many of you that comes from physics, that will be very familiar to you. So almost for 300 years, so you have Euler, Lagrange, and others that developed this, this theory, basic theory in physics, um, that they have uh, optimality principles built in, right? So. And just to, to, put, to put this in, in a little perspective, we have this uh, nice plot, nice figure here that represents um, three kinds of hierarchical kind of problems that one, one can solve, right? So the simplest one is that we have a function and just plug in some values x. Um, yeah, okay, so we can see that. The first one has some values x and the output is some other values. But uh, more complicated problems, we don't know this function, right? The function itself is something we want to find. So in general, then we have differential equations, and the solution to the differential equations are this function. So and the input are boundary conditions and initial, or initial values. But even uh, more fundamental than that, uh, many times we don't know that these differential equations. And these differential equations uh, can be found themselves as a solution to another more fundamental kind of problem, that is formalized by the calculus of variation. That's something that uh, was developed by the same people that developed the classical mechanics, and very fundamental for mathematics and physics. And in this particular case, the inputs of, of the problem are themselves the, some objective function and some constraint. So we are getting close to the scenario that we are looking for. So what they do in physics, for some of you that are familiar with that, in physics they define what they call the, a functional, which is just, um, um, Yes, yeah, something in physics is the action, that's just a name here, is just the integral of something. That, and this function inside the integral is the Lagrangian that defines the system of interest. And just important here is that the system is defining, you notice there's a vector Q that defines the system state. The Q dot is just the first uh, derivatives in time and time itself. So this, if you have some kind of problem like this, there's this calculus of variation, this mathematical machinery that you can use and if you want to find the maximum point or the extreme point of this functional, we just have to solve what is known as the Euler-Lagrange equation. That's a very general thing. Okay, so we are close to what you want to define, the problem you want to define. 
And uh, to de really define this, the problem formally, we are going to use what we call this load balance analysis, which is a general framework that we developed some years ago. And basically just a general or simplified framework for, uh, to develop general cell models. And just taking heavy inspiration of what was already existing, we just try to simplify that to the bare minimum assumption. So one thing is that we use mass units. That's something that simplifies a lot, the expression, and the, I think the understanding also. Um, and we call this, uh, we are interested in kind of what we can name uh, as holistic model, in the sense that we model, we're interested in modeling the whole self-replicated system, basically very close to the sense that Moller and colleagues introduced in 2009. It's a little, little bit different, but uh, essentially it's the same thing. And because we have, uh, talking about the most general possible kind of modeling, these need to be kinetic models in the sense that uh, we, we want to able want to be able to be realistic and to, to simulate to find the properties that are nonlinear to this kind of model. So, this figure here, the schematics here uh, on A is just a very simple representation of the kind of system we are interested. So we have this rectangle representing the cell, and in the spirit of economics, so things are colored like bronze and silver and gold. So the bronze things are these uh, compounds in the environment, right, that are transported in and outside of the cell by this, maybe you cannot see very well, but the green uh, squares there. These are the transporters. Then you have um, blue squares that represent enzymes that are converting uh, these compounds in a network of chemical reactions. And at the end, the products of this network are used by this special reaction, red here, which just name it ribosome, that produces this most valuable thing, which are the proteins in gold color here. And these are, we assume, instantly distributed among all reactions in order to, uh, to, to for the, the, the protein that's catalyzed the reaction. It can be a transport, an enzyme, or the ribosome itself. And we see that these little arrows down here just represented that we assume uh, explicit that things are diluted by growth. So there's no biomass composition assumption. It's not an input, it's an output of this kind of model. And on the right, we have what would be representing more or less the stoichiometric matrix of this kind of system. We call M just because it is in different units. So we have S at these transport reactions. We have enzymatic reactions. And the ribosome is the special um, reaction here. That's the only one which is producing this special compound, which is called P for proteins or polypeptides that are instantly distributed to catalyze the reaction. So that's a very general scenario. So the system state is completely defined by uh, the, the vector C of reactant concentration. It can be, uh, we can call this metabolites, but can be anything else uh, in the system, for example, RNA or DNA. And one entry is just the total protein concentration, this vector C, and the fluxes. Okay, so now we are able to formally define the problem we want to solve. So there will be some equations, as you notice, but we don't want to, we are not getting too deep into equations, more the qualitative understanding. Um, okay, so the, the problem that we want to solve today is that uh, we have this problem. Right? So, so they, as inputs, we have a given model, meaning we have a stoichiometric matrix, a vector tau, here we call tau just Essentially, these are the kinetic rate laws. We assume that we know this information with all parameters and everything. And tau, because these are the, term, the time that each reaction takes, depending on the rate law. And rho is the density of the cell. We assume to be constant. And a given, and let's assume we know the environment, how environment change, or the concentrations in the environment, the concentration of x change in time. We assume you know that. So you want to find the optimal fluxes and concentrations such that Fitness is maximized and uh, under these constraints here. So the, the first one is mass conservation. So this equation is just saying that if you take the flux balance of everything, all reactions accounted for the dilution at each point in time by, by growth, uh, the net production consumption, uh, it, this, this difference gives the net production consumption of the reactant. So that's the dot here is just the time derivative to those things. The second one is just saying that the sum of all proteins that you have in the system have to sum up to this total protein concentration. That's just a definition. And here we have a vector here is transposed the vector fluxes to the vector tau. It is just means that we multiply each flux by the time this reaction takes, determined by the kinetics. This gives the amount of protein that has to be allocated to this reaction. 
And if you sum everything, this is the total protein concentration. And the last one is just that the total, uh, the, the sum of mass concentrations is fixed is the density of the cell. So we have showed uh, recently that if you assume balanced growth, so in other words, if the growth rate itself and the concentrations are constant in time, so basically uh, the difference is that this is zero and this is just a fixed number, um, we can solve this problem uh, or in the sense that we can find the exact analytical conditions necessary for optimal state. Um, but that's not what we want to solve today. We want to solve this more general problem. So the key is to do uh, something very similar that we did before that we can describe as a non-dimensionalization process, just meaning uh, we want to find the minimal set of variables that we need to define the system, and this, these variables are non-dimensional or are dimensional. Okay. Yes. Am I understanding it right that normally the way people think about this is that once the concentration are given, then the kinetic parameters of the enzymes determine the fluxes, mm -hmm. but you're going to treat the fluxes as if they were three parameters themselves, and you're, you're, you're optimizing both over the concentrations and the fluxes. Yes, at the same time, yes. The trick for doing that is exactly what you're presenting here is that the core, this paper that we just published, but the, 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 the key trick to do that, at least under some assumptions, is that especially the, the main assumption is that we assume that the, all proteins are, have the same composition. So that's a generalization. But if you can assume that we accept that, uh, we can show that exactly. If you uh, define these new variables, that are not exactly, sorry, not exactly the fluxes, but you just call the flux fractions, just the, the flux is divided by the growth rate and total density, so that gets a dimensional. Uh, we can show that, so what we see here is just the equations, the constraints we saw before, but in terms of F, right? And just uh, to note here uh, that if you have balanced growth, meaning that the C dot here is zero, we can already see that, um, maybe I can just point that because, because that's easy to know. So this, if this here is zero, the concentrations are uniquely defined by this vector F, right? Because the growth rate basically disappeared in this expression here. So that's the main trick. And if the concentrations are uniquely defined by F, so these kinetic functions are already uniquely defined by F, and we can uh, then completely formulate the problem in terms of these variables F only. And that's what we have in this paper that was published recently in this particular case. And the result we get, just to give a, a very quickly uh, qualitative understanding, is that Assuming this, uh, uh, that the protein concentrations are not negative, we can, we can use this analytical um, method called the KKT conditions to, to find the analytical conditions for that. And these are here, these, we find these expressions that we don't have to go into detail, but what they're saying is that um, for each flux FJ here, each reaction to be active, so this flux to be non-zero, these things in parentheses have to be zero, right? So it has to be optimal in this sense. In, other, in, the other, in the opposite direction, if this thing in parentheses is not zero, the flux has to be zero. So the flux has to be inactive. So this gives the exactly analytical uh, property or conditions for each reaction to be active or not at optimality. And here, just to, to simplify the way to present that, we define this matrix E uh, in this way, and this gamma j is just the sum of each column in M. So just very quickly uh, to go back to reality just a little bit to, to show you guys that this is not just a, only a theoretical exercise here. Uh, we had two previous papers that basically uh, apply this kind of analytical principle in a very particular scenario, so more uh, specific scenario. So in this first paper here, we showed that Using these analytical conditions derived, we could predict um, the amount of active ribosome at different growth rates for E. coli and yeast. So that's the red line here in both without any FIT parameter. We just assume a previous mode of translation that just uh, each has meta kinetics. Uh, you see that it's very close to reality, right? And in this other paper, there's another simplification that one can make and show that uh, basically the message there is that enzyme and substrates are all very close to a optimal balance that is related to this optimal condition I mentioned here. Yes? So in an earlier paper, you also said that the optimization value is dependent on the process. Yes. Um, so can you 
find this uh, back in these uh, equations in parentheses that, for example, the only solutions that you can get is when uh, yeah. only FJs are non-zero? Uh... Yes, and uh, yeah, that's something I don't want to have the time to get too much detail in the mathematics, but thank you for the question, yes. And I think, to me at least, I mean, I'm biased, but I think it's a very direct way to see that here is just uh, because this is a, a matrix that depends on kinetics, and in order for the optimal state to, to not to be elementary flux mode or elementary growth mode, uh, there would be a necessary linear dependency between these things. And we can assume it's not, so essentially reproving, do the same kind of proof again, yes. Um, yeah, just to comment on that, that's exactly the kind of simplification we made in this previous paper here. So that, uh, mod, that solution is more general in this sense. Okay, so, but today we want to solve this more general problem. So, um, just to give the, the meat of the derivation that we want to, to make, or the, the main trick that we, we need to make is that we can take this fluxes F, that we can think of as fluxes in a funny unit that I can even later make the argument that I think does a very actually natural units to use. Um, we decompose, that the main thing is that we want to decompose these fluxes in two other vectors, Q and E, right? And this Q, uh, vector satisfy this equation is just saying that we can see this, this fl as fluxes that each in each point in time they satisfy or they, they would be able to maintain balanced growth. So imagine that the, the cells change its composition state in time, but at each slice of time, these cues would be the, the fluxes that would be able to sustain this uh, balanced growth. But of course, uh, in this general um, Setting is not so. They, this u vector here would be uh, the, exactly the correction for that because the, the concentrations are, are changed. And the trick here is that if you compare both equations, just take the time derivative of that, so just a linear system of equation, we can show that this u vector is uniquely determined by the, the first derivative of q divided by growth rate. And the only as extra assumption here is exactly uh, this one that. Uh, we have a matrix that's full column rank, which means, sounds very esoteric, but it's a very practical meaning, which is we assume that our network, a metabolic network, has no alternative pathway. So if you can produce something, there's only one way to produce it. You cannot have alternatives. And there's still a limiting assumption here, but we still get very general uh, results. So if you assume this, uh, if you make these definitions, uh, just skipping a few steps of derivation here, we can show that we can condense all these constraints, all these equations had before, into two equations. One is one equation for the specific growth rate at each point in time, and you see that magically now all the problem depends on Q dot, is the first derivative in time of Q. The Q itself and X is a uh, vector that's given as input in all our functions of time. Um, for those of you who are familiar with classical mechanics, we see that the choice of Q is also because it really resembles what would be the generalized coordinates of classical mechanics. So the, um, we can call generalized flux maybe here. So we have two equations. One equation is exactly the term, the specific growth rate. And so if you go back to the very initial problem that you want to solve, so what we want to maximize is this, this integral of the specific growth rate that's uniquely determined by these uh, variables here. And the only constraint is the very simple linear constraint here. So uh, that's why we back, go back to this um, thing of uh, the Lagrangian or classical mechanics. So the way to solve the problem now is very straightforward. And if you are familiar with uh, classical mechanics, we can just define this new function, the Lagrangian, just the objective function, and you have now a constraint. And we want to maximize what we can call a functional. So let's call this G. So instead of action, as in physics, we have some other kind of uh, quantity, which is, in this case, I would argue that's much more realistic or much less, uh, much more practical that something can measure that. And that's the integral of this function here. So we just reformulate the whole problem in a, in a way that may seem very um, strange. But it's just because if you, because you formulate in this way, you can use now exactly what I mentioned before, is this Euler-Lagrange equations. So we know that the maximum uh, or if you have an optimal strategy, it has to satisfy these equations. So now, the only thing to do is to calculate these derivatives, right? So a little work, I'm not showing to you, 
that I think that's not very interesting. And if you do that, we find this um, system of differential equations, one for each reaction. So it's a very long, it seems very long equation that I would say you don't even have to care exactly what's there. Uh, maybe the only thing uh, important to mention that it could be much worse, it could be much complicated, because if you look at that, what we have here is, um, this is an ordinary differential equation that's not partial, so that's not as bad. And this is a first order differential equation, so it's not so bad. So that's something that, uh, in principle, is not so difficult to deal with. Because um, of the Lagrange uh, derivation, shouldn't it be a second order by definition? Well, yes, if it's because kinetic function is defined as the quadratic of velocity, but ah, here it is not. Sorry, here it is not defined as the quadratic of velocity. Uh, no, it's okay. Well, uh, I would get back to that method for coffee break, but you see that what is velocity here actually is linear, it's not quadratic, yeah. so that's why it doesn't appear here. Actually, that's a very, we can think of a kind of a growth potential and growth kinetic growth maybe here, because that's something that depends on velocity, then something that doesn't depend on velocity, but that's maybe for later. Okay, so that's it. We have an equation, and the only thing that I just want to mention is that we define this matrix epsilon here that just to make everything in matrix notation doesn't look, believe me, it can look much worse if you use uh, summations here. Um, so what we get here, so if you solve these equations, this equation would be the, the equivalent or the analogous what we have in physics would be the, the equations of motion, right? So in physics, if you, if you find the equations of motion, you know exactly how a system evolves in time in the sense that how it changes in time. And this would be the equivalent of that. Um, so if you solve that, what you have is, um, you find q, so with that you just take the derivative, find q dot, and following the previous equations, we find all the other variables that define the system state in each point in time. Yes. So I'm just trying to understand what's happening here, right? It seemed to me that in your stationary solution, you already had that stationary solution as a function of the inputs x, yes. no? Yes, so but now you good. say x is going to vary in time in some way. Yes. Isn't the solution just, again, simply the solution as a function of x at every time point, like almost like adiabatic sort of, uh, it's not? It's not, and actually, it's we can see exactly here, because if it was, um, what we have here, um, maybe, so we can see that the stationary solutions here, right? The stationary solution would be this term, this term, this term, and this term here. So I this, the yeah, other, other that, yeah, yeah, but I mean, I'm just saying that, yeah, for the first time, that's too much to see, but I'm just making the point that uh, it's different from, the equation is different from the original one. So the, 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 there's still the stationary solution plus a correction because things are changing. So you're saying if the environment is changing, it's impossible for the system to stay on the optimum as x is changing. Well, I, I'll show something about that in the next slide. So there's it's, no yes or no answer to this? Or? Yeah, yes, it's possible, but unstable. So no. Maybe I can change. follow just the next slide. It will be about that. Um, Okay, so at least in theoretically what we did here. So we define formally a mathematical problem that the inputs are a given model, meaning the stoichiometric matrix in these different units, but stoichiometric matrix, the kinetics, we assume we know, and the density of the cell <laughs> of the system. And we know this X how, and how they change the time exactly, right? So we assume we know this information. So we derived what would be the necessary conditions for any if there is any optimal strategy in this environment, they have to satisfy these equations. And meaning they are optimal in the sense that they maximize this proportional growth under this constraint of mass conservation, kinetics, and cell density. So there was no um, extra assumption here in particular, but with the exception that the, the system has no alternative pathway. So today, at least, there's this um, extra assumption. So, Okay, so just to answer the question about the relationship to stationary states, um, just to show you guys a very, very rough uh, numerical solution to, to show you what the solution would look like, I just consider this very simple model for reactions. So we have two transport reactions, and that's something like metabolism here. I mean, everything here is like, it's just a toy model, right? There are labels, but they don't mean uh, anything real. And there's a ribosome that produces the protein. There are KNs here. The AK cats 
forward and backwards, and there are this density here. And assume that the kinetics here, the kinetic rate laws are reversible Michelis or Haldane rate laws. So there's a back and forth um, component. Okay, so to get to your point of the, the difference between stationary, the optimal balance group for a stationary uh, steady state uh, solution and this dynamical solution. So the first thing I compared with was exactly that. Um, and uh, I just mentioned that to solve that numerically, um, it's something I started working on in a few weeks ago. So the very rough solution is using, try to solve a problem that actually is a system, is a, what's called a, a system of differential algebraic equations because the, the first order derivatives are not explicit, but they are implicit in the, the system of equations. So there's some algebra that can be done, and then I just apply the, use the Euler method, which is the simplest method to, to solve this kind of problem, which is particularly uh, not ideal for stiff problems, which that's apparently what we have here. But that's, the results I think are still meaningful. So the first example that I want to show is exactly this question of comparing what would be or maybe a sanity check, right? So would that dynamical, optimal dynamical strategy uh, be better than just stay uh, in a steady state optimal condition? And from the solution that we see here, the answer is yes. So what we have here is the specific growth rate uh, against time. So that's the, the, the simulation. And the red line here is the, the, the growth rate that you find at each point in time, the, optimal, the specific growth rate, and you see that we start at a point that maybe you cannot see, but the growth rate at first, we are starting at the, the, um, the state that would be optimal for this environment if you constrain ourselves to be steady state, right? If you don't change the concentration. So you see that for some time we stay there, but after some time, because of numerical uh, fluctuations, is unstable. So we, we start doing something else that seems to be a, a kind of quasi periodic behavior. Seems like, and these two lines here are just to answer exactly this question: that the, the dashed, black dashed line is um, is what would be the equivalent growth rate if you take the average here of this uh, the dynamical uh, behavior, and the red dashed line is what would be the growth rate if you should just stay as a stationary condition. And you see that there's a improvement here. So even if the environment is fixed, there's a self-imposed self-oscillation behavior that seems to be optimal for the cell. So just to finish, uh, just a second thing is that, of course, then I compared uh, one example here just with the, some dynamical environment and in a very general sense, I just put some cosine here for one of the, sorry, external concentrations. And what we see is just a different solution. It's a very small uh, window of time. So I just want to show as an illustration what would happen, but um, that's just a very rough simulation. So just to wrap up this, um, what I had in these simulations, from this very preliminary numerical exploration of different models, what we have that even in fixed environments, the optimal balance growth states are unstable fixed points, so that's what I mentioned before. Uh, there's often a self-oscillatory behavior that emerges naturally, even in these constant environments. And one thing that's very important is that we need to use reversible rate laws to get more stable solutions. That's something that uh, seems to be very important. And just summarize that, we ha what we have here is actually a formal tool, a mathematical tool, to study or to make sense or to rationalize what I think have been discussed, especially last week, is that the maximum growth rate of an organism in an environment is not always a good measure of its fitness, right? And with this kind of framework, we have the formal way to study what we, uh, to study what what fitness actually is, which is this here, this G here, this measure of the proportional growth in a time. So with that, I'd just like to conclude. Um, we have these exact analytical conditions for this mathematical problem, defining the, what would be this, the absolute optimal strategy, growth strategy in time, and these conditions can be seen as fundamental principles, right, as we are interested in that. And the next question I think many of you are thinking is that, okay, that's all nice and cool, but how close are that to reality? And uh, do microbes implement that to any extent? And that's what we are trying to do next. We are using uh, more realistic models and more realistic numerical solvers to compare that to actual data. And 
with that I'd like to acknowledge Martin Lesch and his group in Dusseldorf and Wolfram, which is also part of this project, and thank you very much. Thanks a lot. So we have time for questions. Uh, thank you. This is uh, promising progress, I think. Um, so you you look you showed us these um, unstable fixed points, and then you said, um, yeah, that that the optimal solution is is not stable. But it's clear that you get a higher growth rate with the unbalanced thing, right? So that doesn't. It seems to me that the the um, balanced optimal solution is just not optimal anymore. Or um, yes, maybe the, the trick question is here that what the conditions are fine, but that's because I think that's a bias we have from physics. Because in physics, the actual the problem is convex, right? And I think that one can show that the, 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 the traditional thing. Here, the conditions only say that the strategy is, uh, is stationary, right? The, the fitness is stationary. So, yeah, you're right. So the point of uh, optimal balance growth would be a stationary point. But it's not optimal, this is not a maximal. Uh, so it could be that you have different uh, fitness, uh, different points. I don't know if that's. Yeah, so I would say if you look at the solutions of the black line, mm -hmm. do you see some kind of accumulation and then depletion of a metabolite that was yes. not possible in the balanced uh, optimal state that now gives you an advantage? Yes, and that's the, the, here's the, the plot of uh, this, the top one, this. Uh, the violet one is the total protein, and the other ones are metabolites. And you see that's uh, this uh, oscillatory behavior. And you see there is even different phase change, and I think this relates, um, actually Wolf has some previous work on exactly oscillatory behavior, and that's the kind of thing you see. It's like the first things are produced first, so the, the first, let's say the first enzyme is more saturated as possible, then you produce the, f the second thing, and so on. And you see that with the production of proteins also. There's this kind of, um, yeah, the, the allocation is goes from the first of the network and goes to the end. There's a kind of wave like that. That's what you see. And of course, that's not possible in balanced growth, so that's why it's a different thing. Yeah, I was just wondering, it was something very close to the question that was made, and because the, the Euler-Lagrangian uh, formalism is, it's always extremizing your functional, yeah. actually, it's never giving you, you can, there are some conditions that are simply yeah. terms that are gonna tell you if it's just a maximum or a minimum, but I was just wondering if there is some like heuristic argument or something simple just for us to see if it's really a maximum in your fitness or. Okay, that's a very important question. The, the short answer is no. <laughs> So not yet, That's, uh, so to be clear, what I show, the equations I showed are necessary conditions, but they're not sufficient, right, for optimality. Um, but that's a very important question that needs to be answered. We are working on that also, yes. Okay, so maybe you can help me gain some intuition. So this, just plugging X as a functional time in your previous stationary optimum, that does worse or better than what you get here? Well, I, I didn't compare, but it has to be worse, right, if, uh, if this is correct. Uh, and the reason is that, um, okay, maybe the, the, at least to me the intuition is that if you change things in time, there's maybe, I don't know, to me that's too abstract, but there's a notion of inertia, right? That's something that a cost of change your state in time. So if you just follow uh, what would be the optimal balance growth for each point in time for the environment, uh, it's not accounting that you're trying to go from A to B in an optimal way. You're just following uh, a trajectory that maybe is not optimal. And that's optimal. because in the previous equation you had the extra constraint that the sort of time derivative of all the concentrations has to vanish because it's balanced and now they're not vanishing. Or exactly, yes. Okay. Yes. Any other question? Okay, let's think. Okay, now we have uh, the coffee break. Just